Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Leifer, and I am the director of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. Along with my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's event, Brachiocephalic Obstructive Airway Syndrome with Dr. Daniel Spector. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll send out a link tomorrow in case you miss anything or would like to share it with a friend. We'll be taking questions via chat and we'll be sure to save some time at the end of the presentation to answer as many as possible. I'd like to take a quick moment to let everyone know about an upcoming event on Wednesday, July 12th at 6 p.m. We will host Making a Plan for Your Pet with Deborah Hamilton, Principal Attorney at Hamilton Law and Mediation. You can find more information and register for that event on our website, amcny.org slash events. We'll also have that info and the link in our newsletter that goes out tomorrow night. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Daniel Spector is a board certified surgeon who earned his veterinary degree from Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine. He then completed a rotating internship in small animal medicine and surgery at Angel Animal Medical Center in Boston before coming to the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center to do a surgery residency. After completing his residency, Dr. Spector worked as a staff surgeon in the Chicago area for three years before becoming staff surgeon and medical director at a referral hospital in New York. Fortunately for us, he returned to AMC in 2015 and is now the head of AMC's Surgical Service II, as well as the Surgery Residency Program Director. His professional focus includes soft tissue and orthopedic surgery with a focus on minimally invasive and reconstructive surgery. We are so grateful to have him with us to lead tonight's lecture. Please welcome Dr. Daniel Spector. Okay, uh, thank you, Michelle and uh, Kimberly and the Uzdan Institute for, for having me. I am going to share my screen here and we can uh, we can get started there's uh, obviously a, a lot to cover um and this is a, a good time of year to cover it uh, the the warmer months are big months um spring summer and even the early part of the fall for uh, our brachycephalic uh, families and, and and their pets so we'll uh, we will get right into it and I guess so we'll start in the beginning. So these are our initial bulldogs back in the 1600s. And so I'm just gonna get our laser pointer going here. So why are we talking about airway disease in, in bulldogs that, that look like this? Um, and, and how did we get from that to here to our, our bulldogs and brachycephalics that, that, that we see today with a much more um, compressed head and, and, and subsequent issues with, with breathing? I think we can all agree that it's pretty easy to see it when this is where they start. And, you know, with our adorable puppies, Frenchies and English Bulldogs and, and Pugs and Bostons and all of our brachycephalic breeds. And so what I want to talk about today is all aspects of brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. And it's a syndrome. It's, it's a compilation of many different um, anatomic changes uh, that create clinical signs that we see. And we'll talk about uh, the anatomy that that leads to it. And we'll talk about the clinical signs that we talk about in our appointments, in our exams, wh when we meet with families, what families are looking for and seeing at home. Um, we'll talk about how we diagnose this. Um, and then our treatment options, obviously. And, and though I am a surgeon, only have ever done surgery, if we can medically manage these dogs, um, that's that's what we can talk about doing. So we're going to talk a little bit about medical management, lifestyle management, um, as well as obviously we'll, we'll get into to some of the the surgical treatments when we talk about surgery, when we recommend surgery, um, and how we make some of those those decisions with with families together. Uh, and just a little bit of a disclosure. I am a surgeon, and there are going to be some some pictures from surgery in here. None none are too graphic, um, but just just a heads up uh, as, as we move move through this. But 
I think uh, we can all agree that some of the most uh, upsetting and and, uh, and and frightening photos that, that we're going to look at tonight are here. Um, and we're not going to focus on the physics, but the, the point of this um, Poisseau's law was a French physicist. The main thing to take away this right here is how something flows, how fast it flows. This is the radius of a tube it goes through. And it doesn't take much of a decrease in the size of a tube to substantially reduce the flow. And that's what ultimately happens in our brachycephalic breeds is that there is a blockage or an obstruction to airflow, <clears throat> excuse me, from outside down into their lungs. And, and when I meet with families to, to go over this, I basically start outside and we work our way in. And here is just a graphic depiction of where the most blockage to airflow occurs. And I promise these are the only two upsetting pictures to, to look at, and we'll get through these fa fairly briefly. Um, but all this is showing, this is resistance. This is blockage to airflow increasing on this line, this axis right here. And this is basically going from the nose back into the throat. And you can see that the most amount of resistance to airflow is just behind the nostrils and, and just in the nose. And this becomes important in how and when we treat them. Enough of the math. And so now we're gonna get more into the, the, the more you know, easily digestible pictures. And we're gonna start, like I said, outside to in. <clears throat> and so the anatomic differences and people will talk about stenotic nares. And, and what does that mean? It mean it means that their nostrils are very, very narrow. Okay, so instead of you know open, open holes, essentially they have very, very narrow slits. So this happens to be a picture of my own uh, chocolate lab, a willing participant in, in tonight's lecture. Um, you can see a close up of his nose, and you look at his nostrils, um, and these are very wide, open circles, and and this is where dogs breathe in almost exclusively, even when dogs are panting. They do not breathe in through their mouth until excessive activity and, and exercise. They breathe out through their mouth when they're panting, panting, but they need to be really, really active. So their nostrils and noses are extremely important. So if you compare Calvin's nostrils here to this bulldog's nostrils, you can, you can see as I put up the little orange circles, the dramatic difference in the opening. And this becomes very, very important because this is entrance door number one to air oxygen um, that these guys are breathing. So right off the bat, they have to work hard to inspire or to breathe in. Um, and so I will sit in a, in a room with, with owners and we'll all close our nose and, and pinch our nostrils and we'll try and breathe in and you can feel, feel the pressure. And so if you look at a CAT scan of a non-brachycephalic dog over here, this is their nose, and a brachycephalic, this, this side is a lot thicker, though the gray is a lot thicker and a lot less well-defined. To make it easier to picture, this is rhinoscopy or a camera in the dog's nose. This again <clears throat> is a non-brachycephalic breed. Uh, a long nose breed like a Labrador in, in this photograph here. Uh, and in this picture, this is a brachycephalic. At the same spot, the um, symbols denote the same anatomic location. Um, you can see that as uh, the brachycephalic breeds become, their, their faces become flatter, everything becomes condensed. And despite having the same amount of tissue or a similar amount of tissue uh, as, as a non-brachycephalic breed, um, it's just closed into a, a, smaller, a smaller space. So this really helps us look and, and see and understand <clears throat> why they have to work harder to breathe and why you know, step number one in, in their nose becomes, becomes challenging and, and difficult for them. Okay, and this is obviously a difference in, in profiles. You can see the Labrador over here with a long, long nose, uh, as opposed to the, the, the Frenchie with a much shorter nose here and what that does with their skull. And again, we don't need to go too in depth uh, with, with the anatomy, um, but this is 
right here. This is the ear. This is the inner ear where the ear attaches to the skull right here in this up and down dotted line. This is where the jaw is, the TMJ, the joint that we can feel when we chew. You can see in a non-brachycephalic breed how far away these are from each other and how close and overlapping they are uh, in, in, uh, in, in a French bulldog. And, and again, the importance of this is it just shows how compressed um, their, their heads are because we start with the nose and the nostrils and just behind the nose, but then we have a lot less real estate and then we have to start looking in the back of their throat. And I'll sometimes use the analogy, which is not exact, but the analogy that their skin folds on their faces that are adorable and we clean sometimes almost happens on, on the inside. And, and you'll see images here, which is, it's not exactly the same skin folds, but this is the back of the throat of a non-brachycephalic breed. Important things to know and to look at. So this dog's mouth is wide open. You see teeth right here. So this is the bottom jaw. This uh, <clears throat> instrument here helps us uh, place them under anesthesia and place a breathing tube. So this is his tongue. This is the roof of the mouth here. This black diamond is extremely important. This is the opening to the windpipe. And it's important because we can see it. We can see it because the back of the throat, the soft palate, which is this structure right here, does not overlap it. And this becomes very important in our brachycephalic breeds. Okay, The soft palate is the way, way back of the roof of our mouth. So if everyone touches their tongue to the roof of their mouth, that's hard, that's bone, that's the hard palate. Even further back behind there that you can't get to uh, without, you know, gagging yourself is the soft palate and that is this structure here. So we're gonna keep this mental snapshot in our minds and then we're gonna look at a brachycephalic airway. And so we're looking same exact orientation. So teeth, teeth, tongue, mouth is wide open. We're looking straight back. You do not see the black diamond right here. You can't see the opening to the airway because the soft palate is overlapping it. This is an elongated soft palate. That's one thing. And as the space gets compressed, you can see these little lima beans flopped out. These are the tonsils. Just like we have tonsils, dogs have tonsils in the back of their throat, in the back of their mouths, in their lymph tissue. They're part of our immune systems, they're part of their immune systems. But, <clears throat> When there's turbulent airflow moving through the back of their throats, they can get swollen, they can get edematous, and then they flop out and they are just another piece of tissue. They're another physical obstruction to airflow. And so this is all important as we examine the back of a dog's throat in preparation for surgery when we get to that because we want to try and open this up as much as we possibly can within the confines of their anatomy. So that's part of our laryngeal exam when we get them under anesthesia. The other things that we look for and we'll cover it a little bit more later on this evening. Uh, you, people will hear of laryngeal saccules or everted laryngeal saccules. These little white balloons in this dog right here, those are the everted laryngeal saccules. They are flops of tissue, <clears throat> excuse me, flops of tissue that live in the wall, essentially, of the top of the windpipe, just around the vocal folds, the, uh, the, the vocal folds. Um, when? dogs have to suck very hard to breathe in, it creates pressure. Remember the feeling that you feel at the back of your throat when you close your mouth, close your nose, and try and breathe in? That can cause them to balloon out, and that is what everted laryngeal saccules look like. So we look for that in, um, in our uh, uh, laryngeal exam because all of these can uh, uh, contribute to our ugly little friend here, which creates resistance to flow and blocks airflow. And this is what we are trying to address when we treat brachycephalic dogs. And so what does it mean? These guys are born with narrow nostrils, 
stenotic nares, and they're born with their flat noses and compressed heads. And so that adds that extra tissue in the back of their throat. And so when they have to breathe harder or suck harder to breathe in, and it creates that, that pressure, it exacerbates the elongated soft, can exacerbate the elongated soft palate that they have. So then they have to breathe even harder and suck harder to breathe in. And ultimately this can lead to laryngeal collapse. And that's something that we want to try and avoid at all costs. And I do love how I see some pugs and Frenchies sitting in laps and things like that. So this is wonderful. I love it. Uh, sorry to jump ahead. So that is the anatomy that creates the clinical signs that we see. And so while all brachycephalic dogs have brachycephalic airway syndrome to some degree, not everyone needs surgery. Everyone is affected differently. And that is where the clinical presentation comes in. Okay. And so who do we see? Males and females, we see equally. Textbooks will say that we see them most between two and four years of age. I have an asterisk there because I disagree. Uh, we see them of at all ages. Quite honestly, um, I would like to see them much, much younger um, because I would like to address them medically and or surgically much, much younger. Sometimes we don't see them until uh, they're, they're older. So the age distribution, I think, you know, we can know from textbooks, but it is not all that clinically important. But what clinical signs are we looking for? What do I ask about? What is someone seeing at home? Um, is there stirter? So something that is very important is the difference between panting and stirter. And our friend here is going to demonstrate this in a second, but all dogs are going to pant. We'll never eliminate panting. We don't want to eliminate panting. But stirter is the <sighs> that sound to the breathing because that is the soft palate overlapping the windpipe. Okay, that's something that I want to know about. Have they ever turned blue, which is cyanosis? Have they ever collapsed anything that severe, uh, like an actual airway crisis? That's important. Or is it exercise intolerance? They can only go outside to poop and pee. They can't even go around the block. So all of those are variable clinical signs just in a conversation with an owner um, that honestly, for the most part, I actually do over telemedicine now um, because dogs get very excited here and I don't want them excited, especially dogs with airway disease. And so this is all a conversation. What are you seeing at home? Can the dog tolerate um, temperature, uh, even moderate temperature? Um, and are there any gastrointestinal signs? What is that? Why do we see that? Um, dogs with brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome um, tend to have gastrointestinal signs, specifically either vomiting or more commonly regurgitation. And that happens again when they suck hard to inspire or to breathe in, their stomach can move a little bit across their diaphragm and that causes uh, what's called a hiatal hernia. Um, and that can lead to, to regurgitation. And that that's an important thing that we need to know because that is going to impact decision-making medications. And so all of these are important pieces of information that I get just talking to owners, asking them. But the diagnosis just takes looking and it takes listening. You can obviously see narrow or stenotic nares on a, in a photograph, just looking at the dog. And then in an exam room, in a video that people uh, email me prior to a consultation, I am listening for this sound that but again that raspy that raspy sound that stirter that is the sound we're looking for because that is uh, uh tissue obstructing the airway so when do we intervene we have our history we have our diagnosis this dog is affected, or this dog has brachycephalic airway syndrome, how do we decide what to do next and how and when do we intervene? Um, and some really important things 
that I use are the severity of the clinical signs. Um, how limited do they need to be? Because even after surgery, dogs will all need to uh, conform to the brachycephalic lifestyle, cool uh, activity in the cooler parts of the day, um, always, always keeping them thin uh, on the thinner side of ideal, which we'll, we'll cover. But I want to know how severe the clinical signs are when they are most affected. Are they only affected in the spring or the summer? Um, are they affected all year round? Um, and then the other thing that's really important is when during the day do you see the clinical signs most uh, uh, frequently? We all expect, and I would say I most commonly see them affected most after heavy activity they're, they're, uh, it's either warm, they're excited, or they've been uh, walking or playing, and they're panting, they're worked up, and there's a lot more sound and effort to their breathing. However, there are a number of dogs, there are a number of dogs who, in talking to families, say, um, you know, he's actually okay, or she's actually okay when we're going about our day during the day, but she can't, or he can't sleep at night. She'll either always rest their chin on a pillow or my leg or the chair of a or arm of a chair, um, or they'll be sleeping and all of a sudden startle themselves awake. Very similar to a person with sleep apnea. And that will become important in how I manage them, which we'll cover as we get into the, the different types of surgeries. But when they are most effective is really important to me. Um, BCS stands for body condition score. It's basically if they are overweight or not. Um, and I am always going to recommend that every brachycephalic dog, that I, almost every brachycephalic dog that I meet loses weight, even if they're not overweight technically, because dogs with airway disease, dogs with orthopedic disease, we always want them on the thinner side of the spectrum. I would always be it should be a badge of honor for someone to look at your dog and say, looks a little bit skinny. You can all high five at that point. And then age, like I said, I, I want to address these dogs early, like even at spay and neuter time. And the reason for that is this is a cartoon drawing of what laryngeal collapse is, which we'll cover in depth a little bit later, but this is irreversible we don't have great treatments for this. So we want to give this dog um, the longest period of time without effort breathing. And that's why we would all like to address them at an earlier age and not sort of see how things go. Again, assuming that they are clinically affected. So what do we do? What are our options? There are several, um, and all of them come with pros and cons. So this is very much a conversation um, with owners, with families, what their expectations are, what my expectations are, what they're looking for, and what risks um, uh, everyone is 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 willing to or 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 wanting to to accept. Whether it's you know the risk of going to surgery or the risk of not going to surgery, and so. We'll start with non-surgical management, um, which every brachycephalic dog needs and, and, and deserves. Um, and that's the lifestyle management that, that I mentioned a little bit earlier, always access to either air conditioning of available or fans. Um, they make these really awesome, which I've only seen in the past couple of years. I'm sure everyone on this call knows better, better than I, these cooling vests that you can leave in the freezer and put them on them. Um, but activity in the cooler parts of the day, you know, the cooler times of year, um, we're not, uh, you know, if, if your dog gets really excited and, 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 and worked up when, f um, people come over, being aware of that and trying to minimize that or having medications on hand, anti-anxiety medications on hand, uh, to give prior to those exciting events, um, treatment of any kind of general health ailments, whether it's metabolic disease, making sure they're systemically healthy. Like I said, always, always weight loss is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and it's also an important part of our, our conversation that this photograph here is not what most of us would expect of, of our Frenchies. Uh, we're not looking for them uh, to run an agility course or 
um, uh, you know, run marathons, but it's not uncommon for people to say that their Frenchies will go hiking with them. And if that's what they're looking for, we talk about how we can best achieve that. But weight loss is exceptionally, exceptionally important. And this is a photograph um, given to me with permission uh, by a colleague of, of mine, a good friend of mine who is a veterinarian who adopted this bulldog. And you can get a sense of how overweight this dog is. Um, and she had a lot of difficulty breathing. And even before, and, and with me as well, sometimes before I'll even offer or consider surgery, she had to lose weight. Um, and he did an exceptional job of, of getting weight off of her. And so he now when you look down on her from top to bottom, you can see her waist dips in here uh, and on this side as well. And so by just losing weight, she looks like a very, very different dog. And she does so much better now. Um, she lives in Kansas, hence the background, but she does so much better now just by just by losing weight. And that can be really dramatic. So that is of exceptional, exceptional importance. When that is not enough, when medical management, conservative management, lifestyle management is not enough, which, um, you know, certainly for, for us here, we're talking about this because, you know, brachycephalic breeds are so common. They're the most, Frenchies are the most popular breed uh, per the AKC now. And so we see this with such frequency. It's really important. I really, uh, I'm so glad to have this opportunity to talk to everybody about this so that we can try and address it at, a, at an early stage and in as proper, in as, uh, you know, in a proper way. Because when the non-surgical uh, options management is not effective, then we're talking about surgery. Now, what do we need to know about surgery? This is general anesthesia. And general anesthesia in and of itself in a healthy dog, just like a healthy person, is actually very, very safe. Uh, it's, it's, it's very low risk in general in healthy animals. However, in brachycephalic breeds specifically, they are at increased risk for aspiration and subsequent pneumonia associated with general anesthesia. Unfortunately, it's an unavoidable, unavoidable aspect of, of being brachycephalic. Um, and so we do everything in our power to minimize that risk as much as possible. Um, because pneumonia in dogs is, and, and cats is the same as in people, meaning it ranges in severity and it can range dramatically from, uh, you know, home on oral antibiotics and pills at home to potentially life-threatening. Um, and so we, we want to minimize that risk as much as we possibly can. How do we do that? Uh, we here um, are extremely I'll say I use the word aggressive with families, but very proactive um, with the medications that we use associated with anesthesia. So I will always take chest x-rays before I anesthetize a brachycephalic dog for any reason, certainly for airway surgery. But if I'm doing an ACL surgery or a mass removal, I always take chest x-rays on that day because I want to know what their lungs look like before we anesthetize and make sure they look okay. Every now and then, We'll see a dog with what I'll call walking pneumonia, and we'll take the x-rays. We'll see that their lungs aren't healthy, though they're not clinically affected, and we will treat them, send them home, and get them back in when their lungs are healthy again. So we always, I always take chest x-rays on the morning of. The medications that we use, the pain medications that we use, uh, are associated with a lower risk of aspiration pneumonia. Um, we use a lot of anti-nausea, anti-vomiting medications, um, promotility medications, which are uh, drugs that we can give to keep the gastrointestinal tract moving in the correct direction to try and do everything to prevent backwards flow, which is reflux, regurgitation, and vomiting. And that's when we see aspiration pneumonia. And we want to keep them calm. We don't want these dogs excited. We don't want them worked up. Um, and we're always working to try and to minimize those 
uh, uh, excitation episodes and, and things like that. And so I am running and, and, and we are running with one of our, uh, our residents and, my, and myself and our whole anesthesia team. We're actually doing a clinical trial right now uh, using a medication that almost every brachycephalic that I send home will go home with a medication called trazodone. It's an anti-anxiety medication that are used that is used in people. Um, it works very, very well. It's very safe, very wide dose range uh, and, and frequency, but it's oral. And I want things working as soon as they wake up so we don't have to really keep them sedate. I just want them calm. And so we're looking at different ways, uh, different tre uh, um, timing and route of trazodone. We won't get too much into it, but um, you know, I certainly talk to this with all of my brachycephalic owners at, at their appointment about consideration of, of that because we're always looking to do better. We've made our decision. We've had our conversation. We all agree, myself, the family, the owners, uh, all agree that surgery really is in this dog's best interest. But I don't know exactly what that surgery will look like or what we will be involved until the day of. And the reason is even the best behaved dogs are not going to allow me to look in the back of their throat, to look at their soft palate um, awake. The only way to look back there is to place them under general anesthesia. We're only going to do that just prior, a single time, so just prior to surgery. Okay. And so, um, we make our diagnosis that it's a clinically affected brachycephalic in our exam room or in a video in a telemedicine appointment. We start with our exam on the day of, confirm once we've actually physically examined the dog, and then we do their airway exam under anesthesia. Now, we're going to look at this, and this is going to be a, a video I'm going to play in a second, but remember, here is our black diamond right here. I imagine at this point, everyone can guess that this is not a bulldog. This is not a brachycephalic dog right here. We already looked at the still image. And so we can see a couple things that I'm looking at already in this dog before we even start playing the video. Number one, you don't, there, his tonsils are way up in the roof of his mouth, normal. I don't see any little white balloons down here for laryngeal saccules. I see this wide open uh, glottis, which is the opening to the windpipe. This is called the larynx back here. And so as we play this video, we can see nothing's really moving. Epiglottis flips up there, but nothing is moving because air is flowing easily. There's no issues at all right here. We're gonna compare that now to the airway exam of a brachycephalic. Now. Before we even look at the video, and we already met this dog as well, but you see the tonsils way, way out. You know, the other dog tonsils were way up here, but again, their, their anatomy is altered. And so as we play this, you can see, you don't see the black diamond because this palette is, over, oh, uh, is extremely elongated. It's covering the windpipe. You don't ever see the black diamond. You don't ever see the opening to the windpipe. So right here, I know that this dog at the very minimum needs his palate shortened, and I will be taking out this dog's tonsils. And so after I do this exam, I get back on the phone with the owner, let them know exactly what I'm seeing um, and what the, what the plan will be. And then we head in, into the operating room. What do we do surgically? There are a lot of, a lot of surgical options. And, and, um, I bring a lot of them up not to overwhelm or honestly even go into terrible detail about any of the individuals. But the important part of this is how do we choose which uh, um, technique we use to open the nostrils? We do with whatever we are most comfortable and have the most success with. So I do a different technique um, than my colleague here, uh, uh, Dr. Schwartz, and I do them differently than other surgeons out there. But the point being is not to be uh, concerned if there is a, you know, a specialist who is a surgeon who does them in different ways because we can either do what's called a wedge resection, which is personally what what I do, and that involves you see this, <clears throat> excuse me, this nost these nostrils right here slits. There's no openings. There's no room for airflow here. 
So what we do, what I do is I make a pizza shaped wedge of nostril, um, just like this photograph up here, the schematic up here, and we remove that wedge. So we remove that portion and when we suture it or sew it closed, you see that the nose is much wider. The nostrils are much wider and this dog similarly. What's important here is we're opening them from slits, you know, very small slits to more oval. And so I do warn people that this is an aesthetic change. This is a visual change, which is upsetting to some owners. However, it's very, very functional um, and is of extreme functional importance. So um, while we always keep aesthetics in mind, um, our main objective and our main goal is to allow them to breathe easier. So I sort of use the analogy in, in an appointment with owners that we sort of take them from breathing through a cocktail straw to breathing through a snorkel. And so it just allows them to breathe in and out uh, just more easily without as much effort. And that's our goal. Another technique, which is, which is done here, um, it's called the trader technique, which is not, the, the name isn't all, all that important, but what that involves is <clears throat> instead of opening or, or, or removing a wedge, what this involves is actually removing the entire side. It's called the alar wing, removing this entire side of the nostril. You can do that um, uh, with with a scalpel blade, um, or and 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 I borrowed these these uh, um, photographs from my colleague Dr. Schwartz here. As that's how she does these, she uses the laser, and you can see this is immediately postoperatively. So there, this is not healed yet. So uh, bear that in mind. But you can see again much, much wider, much more open, and so right off, <clears throat> right off the bat. This dog can breathe um, much smoother, much easier, um, and much calmer uh, through their nose. And so it just has an incredible benefit. What about cats? I don't know if we have any cat owners out there, but just briefly, we're going to talk for a second about cats because we see these too. Um, in general, the brachycephalics, the Persians, uh, cats that we see um, have significant nasal congestion. They don't typically have elongated soft palates, but you can see <clears throat> in this really cute little guy, he has no nose. He has no nostril. And a little bit different than in, in dogs. Um, they certainly are really narrow, but you can sort of see the, I always talk to owners and, and call it the, the, the mustache area, sort of bunches up. And so what we'll do, what we can do is we actually pull some of the bottom forward. It's called an advancement flap where we pull it down, sort of like rolling down a turtleneck that you're, you're wearing to open up the nostrils. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so that's what we did in this cat. So this is obviously preoperatively. <clears throat> Postoperatively, you can see he's opened up here uh, a fair bit more. He's narrow up in here, but he's he's pretty darn open down here, and he breathed really, really well right after surgery for months. But then the owner emailed me uh, and sent me a video, and he said that it seemed like he had scarred down, um, and he was not quite as bad as he was, but pretty darn close to as bad as he was when uh, when I first met him. What do we do at that point? I'm certainly not going to do the same procedure. So what I what I will do in, in these cats, similar to Dr. Schwartz in, in dogs, is I used the laser and I removed uh, the, the, the ALAR wing. So that now, again, this is immediately postoperatively. So you can see it's raw. It will heal on its own. There's no bleeding. There's no stitches. But now he's much more wide open and... This is actually his happy face uh, many, many uh, months later. And now you can actually see openings to his nostrils. Uh, and though he, he, never, he never really thank, thanked us, he just sort of glares at us. He breathes so much easier now. And, and, and uh, unfortunately, he never sent me a, 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 or I don't have the video anymore, but he just breathes so much easier through his nose. So we do this surgery in cats as well. They are slightly different than dogs, um, but we do see this in, in, in cats as well. So I don't want to 
I don't want to leave them out, of course. Then we move to the back of the throat. And this is where we look at the soft palate. <clears throat> and there are different ways of shortening the soft palate, the sort of the fancy word they're called a staphylectomy. And that's when we shorten it. You can do it with cutting and sewing, sort of how we were we were trained. Um, but now uh, nowadays, uh, all of us here um, use either a laser or it's essentially a cautery type device, which is what I use. Um, these two techniques are essentially the same in that they are essentially <clears throat> bloodless and uh, they, they lead to the least amount of swelling. And so these procedures, remember overlaps, shortens the soft palate. But remember those dogs that are most effective at, affected at night. Uh, when they relax, their muscles relax, and all of that tissue in their throat starts to collapse. How do we remove that excessive tissue? There's a procedure uh, that I do. It's called a folded flat palatoplasty. Essentially, what it does is it shortens the palate, very important, but it also thins it. It removes a lot of the excessive tissue in there, and I have some photographs of that coming up. <clears throat> so this is what a staphylectomy looks like. Okay, and so this is prior, immediately prior to surgery. So this is the breathing tube in place. We're looking directly into the back of the dog's throat. Tonsils, again, problem. Other problem, no black diamond. No black diamond. This is all the soft palate overlapping the opening to the windpipe. So what we do is either with the cautery type device or the laser, we come straight across there. Come straight across there and we remove it. No bleeding, but now, color's a little bit hard to see maybe, but there's a black triangle. The diamond is covered up by the breathing tube right here, but now you're looking straight back there, and you can see directly into the windpipe. So we've removed um, what I, I talked to owners about. It's like a curtain blowing out a window, the soft palette. And so what we do is we cut back, trim back, hem that curtain so that they can uh, uh, breathe much more easily. So that's shortening the palate. The folded flap palatoplasty, where we thin it out very briefly, is making uh, an incision <clears throat> around the roof of the mouth, where we actually remove, we almost uh, uh, fillet some of the muscle out there. We remove a lot of the muscle and we bring it forward and we fold it forward and suture it back to the roof of their mouth. And so uh, these are some of the cartoon drawings directly from uh, sort, of, sort of the description of the paper, but this is a, a clinical case. We've seen this dog's mouth a lot tonight, um, but looking again, way, way back, soft palate. After surgery, you can see now there are stitches in this case. And so what we've done is we've folded it forward on itself so that again, now we can see the black triangle. If they didn't have a breathing tube in place, because they, you know, from from surgery, you'd see a black diamond. That's our goal. That's what we're looking for. The laryngeal saccules. Um, people ask about this quite quite frequently. That is technically the first grade of laryngeal collapse when the the cartilage that makes up the opening to the airway starts to weaken and soften and, and collapse. And so. <clears throat> When we see this, people will treat this differently. We know from those um, force and resistance studies that this doesn't contribute a ton to airway resistance and it can carry consequences or, or I should say complications. And so in a dog that has mild, mild eversion of the saccules, I honestly will frequently leave them alone and not treat them. But if they are significantly uh, prolapse or significantly causing a blockage to our black diamond, then we remove them. And it's an important thing to do so. So now we've made it through surgery. Now what? Um, all of these dogs are going to stay in the ICU, at least here at the AMC, the Schwarzman AMC. Certainly with, with me, I always keep them in the ICU. And I do that for several reasons. The inside of our mouths are very, very sensitive. Inside of their mouths are very sensitive. And so despite all the medications that we use to minimize swelling, 
edema, inflammation, swelling can still happen. And so I want them watched very closely by the doctors and the technicians in the ICU 24 hours a day so that they can make adjustments as needed um, because we want to keep them nice and calm, <clears throat> nice and comfortable on all of their medications, their anti-anxiety medications, their pain medications, all of the same drugs that we talked about earlier. We keep them on those overnight so that they very slowly snooze off anesthesia. We give them steroids to minimize the inflammation. I nebulize them just like people nebulize. I was actually talking to a, a, an owner t t tonight. You know, when I was growing up, nebulizing used to mean when I was a, had a cold that I would open an umbrella and sit under a tea kettle and, uh, you know, breathe in the vapor. Well, we use nebulizers uh, with these guys with specific medications uh, that, that cause the vessels to constrict and, and reduce the the, uh, the the swelling. And so, like I said before, we are very, very proactive at minimizing those risks because in some instances, the swelling is substantial enough that we either need to replace the breathing tube from general anesthesia to allow the swelling to come down overnight or in the most severe, but, but, but uh, um, fortunately the least common, we actually have to place a temporary tracheostomy tube, which is a tube in the, uh, in the front of their neck to allow uh, them to bypass the swollen larynx until the swelling comes down and it can be removed. So that is why they're in the ICU, so that anything that happens, we can intervene. And then I want them home the next day to their home, happy, calm place. I always prepare owners that they are still going to have a sound to their breathing. It may even be similar to when they came in, and that's from the swelling. However, <clears throat> over the next five to seven days or so, as that swelling subsides, there's a noticeable difference and improvement in the sound to their breathing. They're never silent. They'll never sneak up on you. They will always have a sound. That's not why we get our, you know, Frenchies and English Bulldogs and, and all of our brachycephalics. We don't get them to be silent. We love the little snorts and the snoring and things like that. That doesn't go away, but it should improve and they should be able to, to breathe more easily. Because we've made incisions in their palate, <clears throat> soft food for two weeks, and that's either canned food, obviously, or I don't change diets. So if they're on a kibble, just soak the kibble in warm water so it's softer, it's less abrasive at the back of their throat. The lifestyle modifications that we already talked about, cone collar and e-collar so they don't scratch at their nostril incisions. Um, and like I said before, a, a redu gradual reduction, never a full elimination, but a gradual reduction um, in the sound to their breathing. And we're looking for both a short-term improvement and a medium-term improvement in their quality of life, their ability to play and do what they want to do and do what you want to do with them. Um, it improves their heat tolerance, but always with realistic expectations. And this is what we've talked about, you know, already this evening. So that th there is the short-term improvement uh, that we're looking for, but also long-term, because we want to avoid laryngeal collapse. And that is a lifetime of sucking hard to breathe in, puts pressure on those cartilage doors to the windpipe, and it starts, and it can start to collapse. So it starts with the everted laryngeal saccules, then the top of the larynx starts to close down, and then the bottom. That's what we want to avoid. This is a dog who had had airway surgery. You can see the opening. There's no soft palate there anymore but the larynx is closed. It doesn't open. And we don't have, frankly, great treatments for this. This is grade three uh, laryngeal collapse. And when we get to this stage, um, our options are very, very limited. And this is when I talk to owners about permanently tying open uh, side of their, their larynx, sort of like an old Labrador with laryngeal paralysis, different outcomes expected. We talk about taking out part of the larynx or a permanent tracheostomy. And this is what we're all trying to avoid. And so when we do a partial laryngectomy uh, or start to remove part of the larynx, uh, what we do is, again, we have our friend right here. And with a laser, we're not 
supposed to uh, remove this piece of the larynx because of the increased risk. So what we do is with a laser, we we open up this. Now it's admittedly not a big opening, but if we go back to that ugly formula, that radius to the fourth power, it doesn't, similarly, it doesn't take a, a much of a decrease to cause a problem. It shouldn't take much of an increase to be beneficial. And so a partial laryngectomy is a potential option or a permanent tracheostomy. And what that looks like is uh, a incision underneath the neck here where we actually make, just like in a person, a permanent opening of uh, uh, into the trachea where we sew the lining of the trachea actually to the skin under their neck uh, so that there's a permanent opening there. Now, these are very labor intensive, especially for the first, I, I at least prep owners, potentially for the first two to three months or so because of the amount of cleaning that's necessary. Um, sometimes these, these guys have a lot of excessive skin folds and we actually have to pull their skin folds back. So these are things that we wanna to try to avoid and we don't need to go into too much depth in this right, right now, but this is what we're trying to avoid, these uh, what we'll call salvage procedures, okay? And so that's why now as French Bulldog has moved into the AKC's most popular breed, but I will say here at the Schwarzman AMC, I think that Frenchies, have been the most popular breed or at least one of the most common breeds that we have seen for many, many years. We see these guys uh, with just incredible and exceptional frequency. And so it's really important and I'm so uh, uh, thankful for the opportunity to be able to go over all of the, the anatomic confirmation changes um, that have occurred that cause what we see clinically that cause the difficulty breathing, why they're having difficulty breathing, and what we can do about it, whether it's surgical or not. Something that's very, very important, two things, early intervention and keeping them very, very thin. So at you know spay-neuter appointments with primary care vets, this is something to ask about. Um, do you think my dog would benefit from this? Um, or obviously, if you're seeing clinical signs, then uh, you know that 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 makes that question easier to answer. It doesn't necessarily mean that we need to do surgery, but at least opens that that conversation. But a conversation earlier in life um, is always going to be uh, beneficial. And the the goal of this is to always not just improve their quality of life now and improve what they can do now, but there's also long-term uh, improvements and long-term benefits that we're looking to try to uh, achieve. So there's a lot of different uh, anatomic variations and anatomic um, issues that, that, that occur and are part of the syndrome, um, but every dog is very much a unique individual and therefore how we treat them is very, very unique as are our expectations. And that's where this becomes quite a conversation with, with owners and families. And so ultimately what, what we want and I think everyone can see that clearly these are different dogs, but uh, one is prior to surgery. And you can hear the sound to this dog who is very excited to be here after surgery, panting. You can hear a sound to their panting, but, and I, I, you know, sometimes the interns and residents will sort of make fun of me, but in an exam room, I will make everybody close their eyes. And if no one can guess that there's a brachycephalic in the room, then we've done our job because you can hear them panting, you can hear them moving air, but they're not struggling. Uh, and they're not, uh, you know, needing a, a, a large amount of effort to breathe. So that's what we're looking for. Um, and that's why we do this. And so uh, with that, um, like Michelle said, we can we can answer some questions. Like I said, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I thank the Uzan Institute for the opportunity to to go over all of that, uh, all of over this, because it's something that we see with incredible frequency. Um, and I'm I'm very glad to to be able to share all the information with everybody. Well, thank you so much for your time and for uh, this was a really 
very comprehensive and informative presentation. We do have some questions, so we'll try to go through them as and get to as many as we can. Um, we had one question about what, uh, other than bulldogs, which brachiocephalic breeds do you see most? French bulldogs. Uh, so, so French mm -hmm. bulldogs are we see the most. Mm -hmm. Uh, French Bulldogs, English Bulldogs, uh, Pugs. Um, we see Bostons, but they seem to be affected, uh, don't seem to be as affected clinically. Um, uh, but that I would say is, is who we see most and most affected here. Okay. Um, is there a diet that you would recommend? for brachiocephalic breeds, I guess, there, less food, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's, no, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. I am uh, I, I am not a general practitioner or primary care vet. And so uh, I don't necessarily have a specific diet, diet type, because everyone also, a lot of these dogs have allergies and food sensitivities. So the actual diet itself uh, is much less important to me as long as it's a balanced dog food for that dog. Uh, it's the it's the volume because typically they are getting more calories than they need and uh, maybe a longer answer than anybody wanted, but less also than the diet is the treats. I talk mm -hmm. to people about avoiding treats uh, like dog treats and instead using carrots or green beans or even a piece of their own kibble outside of the food bowl can be really exciting. And that can be a really good treat that is lower calorie. Great. Um, how do you decide which procedure is best for which dog? Um, you know, when is cutting preferable to laser surgery, soft palate, et cetera? So the soft palate is gonna be based on the sound, that sturder sound to their breathing, the <sighs> that sound. Um, whether we, and, and the laryngeal exam when we get them in. How or the technique that we do is personal preference. I don't use the laser as much as Dr. Schwartz. Um, it's very much a personal preference. We, I actually, and we have done studies to compare the laser that she uses, the, the cautery type device that, that I use. Um, and we have shown and, and published that there is no difference clinically between the two of them. And so that is personal preference. Okay, great. Um, what medications do you use to help with peristalsis? Uh, we use one the, one of the main uh, uh, medications we use is called metoclopramide or Reglan. Um, it's similar to uh, we sometimes people will use it uh, for nausea and stuff like that. Okay, another medication. Do you um, ever use gabapentin or benzos for anxiety, or always trazodone, and why? Um, Yes, but as you know, my cardiology professor in, in vet school always says, it depends, which is a frustrating answer. So what I want, and, and the reason for that is what I want is for them to be calm. I don't want them sedate. So gabapentin and the benzos are more sedating. Trazodone as an anti-anxiety medication is more anti-anxiety. It calms them without sedating them as a general statement. Every person, every dog is a individual in how they respond to medications. Um, so for the most part, I will use trazodone because it's less sedating. If we truly need them, like there's a party at the house, then I will add in a benzo, like a, a gabapentin or, or a medication, like a true sedative. Okay, great. Um, how much pain and discomfort are patients in following surgery That's and for how long? It's really important um, because it goes to the medications that, that we use. We actually use less powerful um, narcotics or opiates uh, in these guys uh, because the medications that we use are enough to keep them comfortable because it's not an overly painful procedure but they are associated with a lower risk for aspiration and pneumonia. The more potent opiates um, have been shown to have a, carry a higher risk of aspiration pneumonia in some airway surgeries. And so um, they're pretty darn comfortable. Um, and I send them home with about a week or so of pain medica oral pain medications, which gabapentin is typically one of them. Um, but frequently owners don't even give them the, the full week of them. Okay, great. Um... Let's see. Do cats have the same extra tissue tonsil problems? Um, is opening the nostrils the only solution for cats? No, it's not the only solution for cats. Um, the nostrils seems to be, at least from what I have seen over the years, the biggest issue that cats have because cats don't pant um, unless it's a problem. Typically, they don't become stertorous, so they their difficulty breathing 
um, is, uh, is, is breathing through their nose, and that's the nasal, nasal congestion that we work to correct with opening the nose, oh, opening the nostrils. Great. Okay. Um, I notice sometimes after walking my dog, white fluid comes out of my Frenchie's nostrils. What does this mean? Is this a sign of something? Very variable. It can be very, very variable. That 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 can be just from overactivity. That can be um, inflammation in the nose or rhinitis. That can be very, very variable mm -hmm. as to the it, cause. Okay. Um, I guess I, this is sim what is white mucus coming out of nostrils a sign of? I guess that's similar. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, is opening the nostrils also good for pets with asthma? Um, not necessarily. Asthma is more of a lower airway disease like, like people, um, which is not a surgical disease. So I will not delve too much into that. It is way outside of my area of, of expertise, but I would not typically, unless there is a concurrent upper airway component being the nostrils, palate, et cetera, I wouldn't specifically open the nostrils in an animal that has asthma. Okay, great. Um, would you advise prophylactic surgery for all of these breeds when young and before symptoms? Hard question, but <laughs> I will say that it is not uncommon for me if I get a puppy, which as a surgeon, I, I rarely do, but if I can get a puppy at their spay appointment or neuter um, and their palate isn't too, too bad yet, but their nostrils are really narrow, I will absolutely um, do their nostrils. I don't necessarily think of it as prophylactic. I still think it's therapeutic, um, but I will open their nostrils uh, at the time of their spay to hopefully prevent progression at a very early age. Okay, great. Um, let's see, everyone's saying thank you so much. This was great. So informative. Okay. Um, and then we'll end with this one. Um, Dr. Runge from Guardian Vet Specialist wants to know how you feel the New York Jets are going to do with Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> I guess we'll just have to wait to see, but I think everyone can see, uh, as Dr. Runge very well knows, and I'm, I'm quite a Patriots fan. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so much. This is wonderful. And we did have some people asking if they could see this again. Yes, we will post the post this tomorrow and send a link to everyone who registered so you can watch it again and share it, as I mentioned. Dr. Spector, thank you so much. This was just such an important information to get out there. I know, you know, yeah, and thank you to your staff for getting you out of, of surgery in time. I know you're so, so busy. Um, thank you, Kimberly, for doing such a wonderful job organizing our events. And a very special thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, have a good evening. Good night. Thanks, everyone.